What is up? This is the Nook Podcast. My name is Steven, and it is such a huge honor to have you listening today. The title you clicked on is correct. We are in the middle of a series called I Suck at Prayer. I feel like God has been trying to draw me closer and showing me that my prayer life has been lacking, and I really want to change that. So I set out to find some stories and talk to people who have seen things happen when they chose to go deeper with God. If you are at all in that same place, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is stephen at nookpodcast.com. You can always find that in the show notes along with links to the Nook Facebook page and my social media feeds. Today, I have the privilege of introducing you to Chris and Stephanie Teague. Together, they are a musical duo from Nashville, Tennessee. And this allows me to take a different approach in bringing you this episode. The Teagues have been through some incredibly difficult times and ultimately some big changes. And they have chosen to use their collective gifts of music to turn many of their deepest prayers into songs. You will get a sampling of those songs woven throughout this conversation. I always like to start with some context, so I ask them to tell me about how they got together in the first place. Yeah, we met when we were, feels like when we were babies, we were 16 and 17. We met through a church that we were both attending. I grew up there. I'd actually never met him before because our it was huge. We never even seen each other. Yeah, our youth mm. group was huge, but we met on a mission trip. Oh, to nice. Philadelphia, to Philadelphia, you know, the place that screams mission trip. Right. <laughs> <laughs> our youth group. No, for us though, we you know we're both born and raised in the Nashville area, the Bible Belt. It was still quite a culture shock mm, <laughs> for I us bet. being in the inner city there, but just quickly connected and. Man, I, I think we spent just about every waking moment together after the first initial bus ride where we kind of got to know each other through playing cards mm. <laughs> and passing ended up the time in the same. Yeah, ended up in the same seat on the bus for the rest of the, the trip. And we knew something was happening. But I got Stephanie you. had Stephanie had a boyfriend. So we were kind of like, I you did. Know, we uh, didn't cross any lines. Respectful. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I slipped her my number after we got off the bus. Um, and yeah, she ended up ending things and then we took off. We stayed in the same town. Stephanie wanted to go to college somewhere else, but she ended up staying here in Murfreesboro, which is where we are still gotcha. to this day. Uh, and we got married halfway through college mm -hmm. and we didn't see the point in waiting. Like we could afford it. We knew we wanted to get married. Nobody mm. was really telling us, hey, maybe you should think about this. <laughs> so we're like, hey, you know, we, we looked like the couple who was doing all the right things. You know, mm. we were in church anytime we could be, uh, volunteers leading worship for the youth. We both were on staff part time in different capacities at the church. So we had everybody's blessing. So we got married when we were 19 and 20. Those early days were normal? As normal as we know. Yeah. Yeah. I think we went into it. I think, first of all, with very different um, expectations, I came from a very typical of the South anyway, a mm -hmm. very solid family, both parents, older brother, um, just really great, great sheltered childhood, but had that image of a, a solid marriage, you mm -hmm. know, a dad who's a spiritual leader and just an incredible home. And then Chris came from a single mother, only child home, you know, uh -huh. wonderful woman, but just very different. You know, he didn't have the same image of what marriage is. Um, and so we were on top of that, we were just so busy because we were still in college. We mm -hmm. were working as well. And it just never really slowed down for those first gotcha. few years. Fast and furious right out of the gate. Yeah. Didn't even really know who we were as people even. You know, oh, at, yeah. At that I get point, that. it's like we were still growing up. Yeah. Right. And suddenly you're <laughs> married and, and in the same house and sharing toothpaste and all those things that, that yeah. <laughs> sounds sounds so lovely, but we know that the friction can set in. Uh, mm -hmm. How long did things go? And I know that I'm kind of looking a little bit into the future from that point, just on based on what sure. little I know. But how long did things go before things we're not going so well. Yeah, we we kept on like that, you know, just 
we had no reason to question um, our marriage. We had no reason to think that there was anything wrong. Um, but as time went on, uh, I started to end up watching uh, a getting into rather just a lot of um, science articles, documentaries, books, things. Uh, it was always a passion of mine and mm. I had lots of time. You know, she was busy. We were kind of ships in the night sometimes. So mm. our free time didn't line up completely and I had a lot of it. So I was diving into that stuff and it was challenging the worldview mm. that I'd been handed. And so I was walking through this sort of normal season of questioning and doubt. Um, the problem arose because I didn't have anyone around me on like from stage or any leaders in my life who I knew of who had either walked through a similar season mm. or who struggled at all with questions or doubts. And so because I didn't see that in my ignorance and naivety, I just assumed that everybody had it figured out mm. or if or if they didn't have it figured out, maybe they just didn't care. You know, it, that stuff didn't affect their faith like it did mine. Mm. And so instead of instead of feeling comfortable to share what I was going through, I ended up hiding and that that sort of secrecy opened up the door to um, some other negative habits in my life. And it caused friction in our marriage that, I mean, we were still on, we're still unpacking some of that, at least um, looking backwards because we're writing a book right now, but um, <laughs> it, 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 it did deeply affect our marriage and our relationship because there's this part of me that I didn't feel like I felt some shame about it. You know, why yeah. didn't anybody else care or think about this kind of stuff? And, um, and I think being in the, going to school for the music industry was also kind of a gateway to some not so wholesome <laughs> activities that are common in the music industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I had, I had friends uh, both in the music industry and in restaurant jobs that I had. And, and I felt more, I felt like I could relate to them more than I could to some of my friends in the church, at least about this kind of stuff, right. you know, cause they, they, um, they had the same criticisms maybe that I did. And mm. so, uh, it, it started this, this, this split of who I was that continued on for years and years where while doubt and questions just festered and did not go, uh, it was not healthily addressed. Um, mm. Just in my ignorance, I didn't know how to attack something like that, or, or and I certainly didn't feel like I was being attacked. Um, I just sort of felt like it was what I had to do. It was a journey that I had to take alone, and so eventually it led to, you know, hanging out with those friends and you know doing some of the things that they were doing and drinking and mm. weed and drugs, anything I could get my hands on. Really, it was it was um, I wasn't experienced. I wasn't experiencing God the way that I thought I was supposed to. Mm. Um, so I was seeking these other sort of experiential things. So I'm curious then if, if you're still kind of, uh, kind of a hand in both boxes at that point, what kind of attention were you feeling at least within? It's like you've obviously getting plenty as, as I'm understanding from that crowd that you're just talking about there, the, the, their influence, the, the alcohol and everything else versus that life and, and that you were still leading worship and things like that. What was, what was happening internally for you when, I mean, did you feel like you were being pulled in two different directions? Um, strangely, I, I didn't, I, mm. I did, but I didn't recognize it. I, it was having an effect on me, but um, I'm just not really good at noticing long-term patterns. I notice day-to-day, moment-to-moment kind of emotions and stuff and what's going on in my interior, but I it's harder for me to recognize long-term patterns. And um, it really did. I mean, it, it caused a lot of um, tension and turmoil in my heart because it was it, that does violence to our soul, mm. you know, to, yeah. to be – to be inauthentic, to to not be fully known, um, and walk through something as difficult as 
I mean, we could just call it deconstruction. That's what was happening. Yeah. I didn't call it that. I didn't even know what that was. It wasn't even a word yet, but um, that's what I was walking through. And it was, it was hard to do that alone. And it was certainly, it certainly caused a lot of inner turmoil as long as well as, um, you know, friction in our marriage and friction just in my other relationships with people in the church. Sure. Well, and it's, I, I'm, I'm glad you used the word violence. I think that that's probably a, a, a good place to, to, to start because maybe I know just enough of the story here, but when you're dealing with that kind of inner violence and it eventually comes out in force, uh, and I feel like I'm speaking cryptically here. How did that all come <laughs> to a head? Yeah, it did come to a head. It, 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 that, that separation of who I was, um, that double identity, uh, continued and it got to the point where, um, I, I didn't even believe anymore. Mm. You know, I, I was still doing all the right things. I was still serving. I was still leading, um, still married. Um, and Stephanie kind of knew maybe that I was wrestling with some questions, but she thought I had it handled. You know, I, I told her, I was like, Hey, I, you know, I've maybe got some questions. I'm reading this book. I'm reading that book. Um, and she, you know, maybe she would, she would even say naively optimistic. Yeah, I mean, to just... it seemed like, oh, well, that's probably normal, right? Like when you're raised in the church, you have to kind of make your faith your own at some point and examine what you were handed in life. So I thought He's, it's fine. Like he'll get through it. It'll be fine. And I, yeah, I just didn't press into that. And, um, yeah, so, so we can't keep that up. You know, we can't. Yeah. Uh, it takes a, I was very good at it, at least from an external perspective. Nobody knew anything. And yet um, I sat Stephanie down in January of 2010 and told her I, I didn't believe in God anymore and I didn't want to be married anymore. Oh, wow. Um, and we, we divorced. You know, I, I filed papers shortly after that. My walls are crumbling. Paper thin feels like I'm paralyzed and I can't breathe. He made a vow with me, he swore he'd never leave. Now his heart's in your hands, but it won't be. Okay, Stephanie, I have to ask in a moment like that, that even though you've been trying to reason what life was like leading up to it, but is there any way for you even to describe a, a mushroom cloud like that as he walks in and makes such a what? Yeah, uh, very much a mushroom cloud. I haven't used that one before, but that, that does feel, mm. that feels pretty accurate because I never, I never in a million years thought that that was what he was going to tell me that night. Never. You know, I, I knew that we, you know, we struggled some with our communication and it was hard to kind of see eye to eye on some things. But I, I just always kept telling myself, it's just a season. We're busy. We've always had all this going on. I had just finished graduate school. You know, surely we're going to, it's fine. Like things will settle in. And yeah, then my husband, my best friend, dropped that bomb on my life and it just blew apart no matter how much I tried to keep the pieces together. You know, I couldn't. I couldn't. And then there I was at 23 and divorce became a part of my story. So how many years in was that at that point that you guys had been married? We had been married three and a half years. Okay. 
so this this whole month that I'm focusing on prayer, I kind of have to go that direction. Um, sure. When you are sitting there, just having had your husband walk in and make such a brutal pronouncement, is prayer even on your radar? Hmm. What's what's your first, well, I mean, what's your go-to in a situation like that when it just seems like your world has just imploded? My My very logical brain couldn't even... I couldn't, it's like it couldn't compute what was happening. Mm. You know, I was trying, I was trying to make sense of it. I was trying to fix it. Uh, my go-to at that time was not to go to the Lord. That took me a while mm. <laughs> to get there because I just, I had, you know, working through a lot of this over the past 10, 11 years, learning how much I needed to, to feel like I was in control of my mm. life and finding a lot of security in that. So when that was violently stripped away from me, it was, I just couldn't even function. Couldn't even figure out what my emotional state was <laughs> initially. You know, it, it took, it took quite a while for me to, to get past that initial shock. Right. Um, but after even just a month later, I was at a women's retreat with our church, and I almost didn't go because, you know, I my life is just a complete mess. And I ended up going, and I find out that the theme when I get there is uh, finding joy in your suffering and mm. in your trials. And it it was transformational for me at, the, at that beginning of my journey of, of what the Lord had for me that year because, you know, we believe in a God who doesn't waste anything, and He— 100% did not waste that season in my life. And so I was given this beautiful tool of some handouts at the retreat that were just scripture after scripture of of prayers from David, of all these different places in the Bible where it just points out that God, is He can use your suffering, that there's yeah. beauty that comes from it, that He doesn't waste anything. So that I think that was definitely the beginning of of that prayer journey for me of learning what it meant to fully trust him, to let go of the control that I just clung to so tightly. Well, then Chris, you've just made this announcement. You're, you've put a mark. What was that next six months like for you based on kind of that as a, as a trigger mark? Yeah. Um, I think, I think when, so we talk to lots of people who walk through seasons like this. And so we know lots of people who've had bombs dropped in their lives. And I think for someone like me, I'd been living with that for years. You know, I've been, I'd been hiding and, and walking with all of this. And so to just drop it in her lap, um, I, I didn't, I didn't quite understand. And I don't think we ever can quite understand what that does, mm -hmm. um, to somebody. But as I, as I, did share all of that telling the truth and being honest is is good for us right so there was it was really hard and i hated what it did I, we didn't hate each other i hated to hurt her mm -hmm. um it was like a relief there's a relief there mm -hmm. i think yeah it's like finally kind of being known you know that at least at least i at least i was telling the truth right so yeah. the truth can bring freedom the problem was that i was sort of I was I wasn't seeking the truth. I was telling the truth, but I wasn't seeking the truth. Mm. I thought I was, but I'd been deceived into thinking that I would be happier if I wasn't held accountable to this standard that I didn't believe in anymore. I wouldn't feel as so much shame, you know, if I didn't I could be I said that would allow me to be myself. I could be happier without with someone who I could live my life with um who was unlike Stephanie, who was more like myself. Mm. Uh, our our strengths. I didn't see our strengths as um, our differences. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see our, all differ of our differences. Yes, yeah, so I didn't see all of our differences as strengths. I saw them as as hindrances. You know, right. so um, I did feel good for a while, at least after the initial kind of bomb, if yeah. we will. I did feel a relief, and I did I did have a good bit of newfound freedom. Right. Uh, and I was able to do the things that I that I thought would make me happy and pursue 
more of the same, you know, friends and drugs and drinking and parties and girls. And, um, I wasn't really into just, um, I wasn't really sleeping around or anything, but just being able to, you know, date or whatever and find people like myself. And, uh, that was, that was fun for a while, but, um, that, that bank account is, is rather, is rather low on funds. Mm. If you get what I'm saying, there's yeah. not much to draw from there. Um, and so I quickly ended up in a very broken and desperate place. You know, the things that come to light will be exposed. That's what, that's what scripture tells us. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'd been believing lies. I'd been living a lie. I'd been telling lies or at least hiding behind, um, you know, white lies and things like that. And so this life that I was living had been exposed and it, it withered in the sunlight because it was, it, it wasn't full of life. It was full of death. It was full of destruction. And, mm. um, so how long yeah, I, before you started having those kind of realizations of, wow, I'm way off. Was it something that happened or was it just that you started to see how, how empty that whole side of life was? No, it took, it took something. I'm not smart enough to just, um, <laughs> come to that, on to your just own. <laughs> come to that on my own. Um, I, I was, I was getting into relationships and one of them that I got into, I got pretty serious, pretty fast. Um, and you know, I thought it was, I thought it was everything. And, um, I was very deceived there too. It was just wishful thinking as idealism. It was, you know, rose colored glasses. Uh, it was, it was bound to fail, um, because I'd carried all this baggage into it with me. Mm. You know, I wasn't telling the truth before and now I thought I was living in the truth, but I was still being deceived by this lie. I still had all this baggage. And wow. when that relationship ended, it ended in such a way that, um, it sort of exploded. I had the bomb go off in my life because when that ended, it didn't, it didn't fizzle out. It exploded and. Um, it exposed a lot of things about me to me, mm. my selfishness It exposed uh, the depths that I was willing to go to hurt other people mm. just to stay happy. You know, it helped me kind of open my eyes and recognize this pattern because I would left everything thinking I would be my full, complete, true self. And I was broken and alone and miserable mm. and I had to face that the truth, the hard truth of that and in that season of complete shattering of of who i was um and the loss of of this dream that i'd had of being satisfied and fulfilled forever um it left me extreme i was waking up in cold sweats i was having anxiety uh, which i'd never I never struggled with before. Mm. Um, and I don't share this too often, uh, but Stephanie had found a Bible from my dad. You know, she mentioned that, that I uh, didn't have that, that family unit. My dad had passed away when I was 12 and um, he left me a Bible. Mm. He'd had, he'd had his own journey of, of um, sort of falling apart and being put back together. And he, he wasn't around even when you were young. Yeah, yeah, no, he wasn't around. He left when I was two and he died when I was 12. And so wow. this Bible that he left me, he put a letter in there and that letter, Stephanie left it out on the count on, on the, on the nightstand or when I moved out, when she moved out and I just sort of ignored it, whatever, you know, I knew that it was there. I knew that he'd written it, but whatever. Um, I knew what it said and I just kind of ignored it. But in that season, um, in that letter, he said, um, there will come a day when you will question everything that you've learned. And when that day comes, just remember that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that it was specifically that letter, but there's definitely something to our past and our genetics and our history and the, and the father, right? This father mm. sort of wound speaking to me from beyond the grave. It, um, it kind of helped usher this, this experience of love with God, oh, you know, sure. because I did not deserve, 
I deserved nothing. I'd have given away everything that God had tried to bless me with. I think the reason nobody questioned that we were getting married was because they were trying not to scare Stephanie away. They were like, wow, can't believe he somehow managed this. Let's not mess it up. <laughs> um, and yet... The world is hard pushing back. Well, now you tell me, are we truly free to speak and say things that we believe? Were we surrender to the enemy? Yeah. With a gun to my head, when I say what he said, when I sway from a threat or die for it. The truth And yet, I, I still managed to mess it up. And, um, you know, God's love found me in a way that intellectualism couldn't let me know. You know, mm. we think that we know things through our minds, right? And that's how, that's, that's this Western enlightenment thing that we've, that we all, we swim in these waters, but we don't necessarily even recognize it or know it. Yeah. But in those, in that season, I experienced God's love in a completely new way than I ever had before. So did that start the turning back to, to actually <laughs> headed back to where we are now? Uh, you know, just trying to, to hit the points of, of sure. this journey. What was that Absolutely. turning like for you? Yeah, we're sitting here today together. So we are obviously, sitting together, obviously so something happened. Something, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I walked through, um, just sort of pour myself out to God. I hadn't been honest with anybody. I just started mm -hmm. being honest with God, praying to him my real prayers, not the right prayers, real prayers. And um, instead of running away, like I maybe thought he would, um, he just poured right back into me and sent community around me. He would reveal things to me through his word. And uh, it was this beautiful season of growth and transformation. I felt, I, I mean, I, I think I was saved in high school, but this still was just something completely new and different. And all along that way, I heard this whisper um, that I ignored at first, but eventually couldn't ignore anymore. Mm. After months, um, this voice was telling me to pursue Stephanie again. So um, how did that I, hit for you? I mean, did that, how did that hit even, even in the midst of you, this, Steph? this renewal, I'm just curious, uh -huh. obviously for the both of you, what, what does that even begin to look like when things well, didn't end so well? It's so strange. Cause I, <sighs> I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to describe it. I, I had just sort of closed off all possibilities. I'd completely, written off the possibility that we would ever be together again. I even told her at one point, even if I became a Christian again someday, we just don't make sense. Mm. And I think God probably kind of chuckled under his breath. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, the, to me, I, I, it, Stephanie was a safe place for me. Mm. Stephanie was always a safe place for me, even though we, we had tons of issues and baggage mm. that we could work through. We both she, did. <laughs> she was, she was safe. I didn't ever have to worry or question that she, you know, loved me. I thought I didn't think I deserved it. I didn't think I was good enough. She was better than me, but you know, I, I, I felt safe. I just didn't think we worked, you know, mm -hmm. relationally. So it was weird. I didn't, I didn't, I did ignore it for a little bit. Uh, but that, that call home, that leap of faith ended. Um, well, I acted on it. I called her parents first and oh, met nice. with them for about, met with them for an hour or two. And then, um, they felt decent, I guess, and called her and we walked around her neighborhood for two and a half hours. And then well, I, and I think your, your idealism was still like a big part Yeah, <laughs> you are, because we had not talked. I mean, we've been divorced several months, hadn't talked in a long time. And so we spent a couple hours sharing what God has done, what we had learned. And, and by the end of the conversation, Chris shared that God told him we should be together again. 
<laughs> like, okay, realistically, let me think for a second. Um, cause for me, like I said, it was, it was a very necessary journey of a year for me and my walk with the Lord as, as much as I looked like the good girl quote, I'm doing quotes, air quotes, <laughs> the, the good Christian girl, you know, everybody could see what he had done. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really easy to feel like the victim that didn't have any part in, in this deterioration of our marriage, but my, my sin, as God so graciously showed me, my sin was just in my heart. It was just not as obvious. You know, I had so many, so much pride and self-righteousness and all this ugliness that I brought to our marriage that was just as destructive. So, so meeting for that first time after the divorce and no, like we were both completely different people, both yeah. of us, because of what we had learned about ourselves, what we learned about who God is and his love for us and what he can do, the redemption that he can do. Um, for me, I had gotten to a place of thinking, well, I, I truly believed that he would come back to the Lord, but I didn't think that I would be a part of that. Mm. Um, and I was okay. Like, I, I knew, I believed that God was still good, <laughs> that he still had a purpose for my life, that the redemption that he did in my own heart was enough. And seeing what he had done in Chris's heart, like that would have been enough. Mm. Um, so we we ended up taking a few months. Chris was already doing some, he was in counseling. I started doing some. We were meeting with the same counselor individually and um, just wanted a season of time there to really pursue what the Lord had for us since we just did everything on our own the first time around. We didn't involve community. We didn't involve older, mm-hmm. wiser voices into our story. We didn't. I mean, some of that we were just naive. We didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know yeah. <laughs> being so young. And so... Long story short, uh, we all came together uh, and agreed that if we wanted to do this again, that we we should go for it. So we ended up dating again, like full on started over <laughs> for a few months and ended up getting remarried in a small ceremony with just our family. So we have two anniversaries now. Darling, here we are. You know every strength and every scar You see in every part Still we hold this vow We'll keep it even when we don't know how Somehow we'll figure out Love will keep us tight wanted to try to correct some of the mistakes that we'd made the first time around. And one of the mistakes that we made was just not knowing that we need community. We need people around us Mm -hmm. to walk with us, to ask us hard questions, to know what's happening in our hearts, to know what's happening in our minds, to help us. We don't, we're not equipped. (laughs) We're not equipped to walk through life alone. And so we wanted to correct that. So we did involve, you know, more like being interviewed by family and friends or anything, but we wanted to allow people the, the window in. Um, So we saw counseling, we did pastoral stuff together. We uh, wanted to make sure that, that we were doing things the right way. Um, And I think it was a sweet season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say that for sure. And there was, there was a, a vulnerability present in our conversations that was not there before. Mm. Um, I think on, on both sides, you know, for me, it it was it's a lot easier for me to put up walls and feel, and that's like a safety and security thing, you know, yep. in the past, and and maybe not even know fully what I'm feeling. And I, for any enneagram people listening, I'm an enneagram one, so a lot of times 
it's it's easy. You kind of like filter your emotions. You're like, oh, no, that's a bad one. We're not going to deal with that one. Oh, here's a good one. We're going to put this one out. You know, whereas Chris, who, as the four, he can just be, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. It's mm. hard to not be your emotions. So, um, but it was just a really, really sweet time of kind of learning who we were again, like personally, but then also the other, you know, the other person and, and our, we say it all the time, like our second marriage is way better Mm. (laughs) than our first. And it's just, it's unrecognizable because I think we, as, as humans, like we are unrecognizable from our, from our dating early marriage selves. And, and all of that is just a testament to what, what God can do. You know, I don't, I don't know that I ever could have imagined the degree of, of redemption in our lives that Mm. he could do. That's so good. Uh, did you, was there any hesitation on your part, Stephanie, that, that, I mean, obviously it sounds like you guys took things at a very nice pace, but I guess I'm just wondering what your life was like in the quiet of some of those early redating days and just, you know, maybe even asking God, am I crazy? Uh, as you were pondering what an, a new life like this might look like. For sure. When we first had that, that meetup, I, you know, I had forgiven him, uh, but trust of wise people who will <laughs> have told us trust takes time and it should mm-hmm. take time. And so we took a solid three months separately. We didn't, we hardly talked to each other. And I just wanted, I wanted the Lord to tell me just flat out, <laughs> like, this is what I want for you. Because I had gotten to that place of like, I'm, I'm, you know, I trust you with my future, even if he's not in it. And I wasn't clinging to that for like my ending anymore. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, there was one very obvious moment for me, again, a retreat, you guys got to get away sometimes (laughs) (laughs) when you're like, our lives can get so busy and noisy and just my brain never stops. So to get away is very helpful. But I just remember to this day, there was a kind of like a forced silence and solitude portion of the retreat. And so getting out in nature and just like, I think I found a bench and I was just laying down and I just remember so clearly as I'm like reading over some scripture, just feeling this almost like, I think I was, I was waiting on God to say like, yes, um, before some of that self-protection, you know, you don't Mm want to get your hopes up, but I don't know. I just felt a peace about it. And, and knowing that we had, you know, kind of the grace of a, of a counselor, like a biblical counselor we trusted who was seeing both of us, who we eventually saw together. I just, yeah, I, I didn't, there was not a lot of fear or doubt at that point because I really felt like God was in it. Yeah. Well, and I, the redemption is the, the word that I would have uh, quickly labeled what I saw in, in the video that when I first learned about mm-hmm. you too. Uh, so Chris, then I'm wondering if that word occurred to you as you're standing there making your vows with this woman for the second time, uh, what was that moment like? for you in light of, of seeing that, that God had redeemed such an amazing story. It was, it was surreal, I think in Mm. some ways. Um, it was, yeah, I mean, redemption has been the song on our lips, uh, ever since, um, ever since that happened, you know, there's the scripture in revelation says, um, what's a, it's a, it's looking ahead It's prophetic, but it's God saying, I'm making all things new, mm. but that's already happening. You know, God is already making his project is already underway. Yes. It's been underway. It was, uh, it was, uh, completed through Jesus. It's not yet fully completed, but it was inaugurated through Jesus. And so, um, he's making all things new in us. I knew that I saw that I tasted that, you know, taste and see, yes. not think, not think and know, right. Right. <laughs> That's Taste good. and see That's that I'm good. So I had I'm I'm standing and seeing and experiencing this this love and redemption and restoration that that has become such a deeply entangled part of my faith that I can't separate the two now. Mm. And even if doubts do come back, and they do, and that's fine. I I welcome them now. Um, but one of the greatest defenses against 
a doubt or a, a deep question of faith is to just remember God's story, his hand in our life. Mm. And if you don't have a story yet, if you don't have a story yet, maybe it's time to step into it. And that's part of the experience is stepping into a life of faith. Right. So I, I knew all of that walking into that. Um, one of the fun little f- redemptive um, winks, I guess. God wink. I, I, I wouldn't say I hate that term, but, you know, that silly right. little God wink. Um, our, our, uh, my best man from our first wedding became the officiant oh, of nice. our second wedding. Um, so it was, it was a very... Lots of full circle things. Yes, lots of full circle. That's lots awesome. Lots of full circle moments. Well, how many years ago was that now then, well, from, since the second wedding? So it's been 11 years, 11 years we've been wow. remarried. Mm-hmm. This is a, a it's got to be a 180 from what things looked like in the, in the first go round. Yeah. And, and just about every aspect. I mean, even, even what I thought my life would look like <laughs> the first time around. I mean, I had, I got my graduate degree in education and thought I would be teaching or doing some kind of social work, advocacy stuff for children. And now, because of what God has brought us through and these little, seems like breadcrumbs, he kept um, dropping. Like we now do ministry full time through the music that we write. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, we have a duo called Out of the Dust and our, our mission is to share our story through music to bring people that hope that God is a God of redemption and restoration, no matter, no matter what our endings are. You saw me, heartbreak hanging in the air. You heard me, wonder if you even care. Witness the walls I built, you felt the pain I felt. You saw me, unaware. Cause the fog in the valley so heavy that it was blinding But now looking down from the mountain I'm realizing That here in the after I see it so clearly In my disaster your love was so near me I had no need to worry and no need to doubt You found a way to take all my pain and make it all better Here in the after Does your story work hand in hand with your music as as you go out and, and share this amazing gift? Yeah, people call us uh, musicianaries. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, or uh, another awesome. one. What did they say? They uh, yeah, this summer, a pastor, a pastor called our concert like a mu- yeah, musical storytelling because we very much, in the way we write and the way that we perform, our, our stories woven throughout it. So mm. it's it's always it is always the kind of the framework of what we do is out of the dust. But but even beyond just the story of our marriage redemption, it's really all to point to the God of redemption. You know, this is this is his story. This is the story of a God from, as you read through, from Genesis to Revelation, he is a God who chases his people down mm. and, and redeems. And the beautiful thing for us to see is we, we do try to write very personally, things that are very true and specific to us, but at the same time, we don't want to we don't want to close people off mm. and it's been beautiful to see how even just through our our honesty with our own our own story our own brokenness trying to steward that well um if you're familiar with poetry there's this term called a slant rhyme right mm. so um i think redemption is a slant rhyme in all of our lives so regardless of what your story looks like there's going to be some rhyming and resonance, right? Or somewhere a story of hope and redemption can meet you or encourage or bring some sort of light into a dark place. And that's that's probably my favorite thing is someone who would say, I, my story is nothing like yours, mm. but I completely you know, identify or am, am, am encouraged and challenged by, by your story. This podcast has allowed me to meet some of the most amazing people, and it never ceases to amaze me how folks that I am often meeting for the first time are so willing to share their amazing stories. 
add Chris and Steph to the list of people who absolutely inspire me and make me want more of what Jesus is offering to all of us. Please check the show notes for links to their music. It is all so good. And it was such a treat to be able to share some of it with you. This series on prayer still has two more weeks, so make sure that you are subscribed to The Nook on your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for listening today, and I will catch you here next time in The Nook. The Nook Podcast is a production of Sozo Digital Media.